1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. We'll start reading. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but now ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that that which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So what I want to talk about this morning is how to glorify God in your body. Because the Bible tells us very clearly, you know, to do that. Okay, we've been bought with a price. And so God wants us to glorify Him in our body. All right? And, uh, it, because it is God's. Glorify Him in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Our body is the temple of God. And you know, when you read the Bible and you read about the temple that God used to dwell in and how magnificent of a building that was, you know, it's amazing that God chose to go from that to dwelling in us. That's Nothing really that magnificent about us. But understand that we have his spirit that's dwelling in us. We are his temple. We are where he dwells and that we ought to glorify him. And so a few things I want to show you this morning about how to, uh, things that will help you glorify God in your body. The first thing you need to do is you've got to remember that you are not your own. Okay? Your teenagers, maybe they'll say these things like, oh, you know, it's my body. You know, I should be able to pierce it up, tattoo it up, you know, whatever. And they'll, you know, they'll tell their parents that. I should be able to do what I want with my body. And, you know, and the parents usually return with something like, well, you know, when you're on your own, when you're paying your own bills and buying your own food, you know, you, those arguments have gone through many households before. And I think that's legit uh, to a certain extent. But at the same time, even after you get out on your own, and you have your own house and you're, you're paying your own bills. You do need, if you're saved, you need to remember, you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Well, fine, I just won't get saved. Well, guess what? If you're not saved, you're still not your own because you belong to the devil. And just so you know, the devil will let you do whatever you want to with your body because what you will want to do with your body, it will destroy you and the devil hates you. And so he will let you do whatever you want. But the Lord loves you. He cares about you. He wants you to be happy. So he's not going to, he's not going to let you do whatever you want. So just keep that in mind, but you are not your own. And you know, so that's something we need to think about. And there's some principles here. I want to show you that even in our own personal lives and our marriages, I, I think, uh, hopefully we'll help you with this. But first of all, you know, it's one thing. Okay. Remember this body. Yes, it's ours. Okay. It's the only body I've got to work with. It's the only one I'm ever going to have. And, but at the same time, while it is mine, the Holy Spirit lives with me, doesn't he? And you know what? If you have a house, okay, if you're married and you have a house, that house, you need to remember, it, and my wife, I was hoping she wouldn't be in here or something when I brought up this point because I don't, I don't want to think I'm a hypocrite or anything. I'm not saying I'm good at this stuff, but you know, you need to think about the fact that, okay, this is our house. Okay. It, yeah, it's my house, but it's her house too, isn't it? So do I have the right, even though I'm head of the household, to just trash it as bad as I want to and, you know, and do whatever I want? Listen, you're not your own, okay? And once you, when you get married, you need to remember that. When you're, you know, you're married, you're living in the same place, nothing is your own anymore. So you need to think about these things. And you know what? I'll say that. You know, I'll admit my faults about the house. But you know what? You should see what she does to my truck. And, you know, so just keep that, you know, keep that in mind, too. None of us are perfect. But, you know, it is. 
if, if you're single and you want to live in a pigsty, you know, okay, fine. You live in a pigsty. It's, it's just your house. But just so you know, though, if you're saved, your body is still the temple of God. And, you know, if I can just harp on this for a minute, if your body is still the temple of God, you can live in a pigsty all you want. But let me tell you something. You shouldn't go out in public representing Christ smelling, you know, like you live in a pigsty. And it's amazing how many Christian people haven't got enough character to take a bath and how to wash themselves up. You're a Christian. You're a representative of God. And we don't need to be going around, you know, representing him you know we shouldn't go out soul winning smelling horrible and looking horrible do something with yourself you know dress decent look nice you know be pleasant wear a smile don't have that sour look in your face and by all means you know clean up i know we live in difficult financial times but soap is cheap water is cheap Deodorant is cheap, and it's amazing how many people, they've got enough money to buy video games and cable TV, and they can't afford to take a stinking bath and wash their clothes. It's not that expensive, people. Just do these things, and they wonder why they can't get jobs. They wonder why they don't get any respect. They, you know, they want, some of these single guys, they wonder why they can't get a girlfriend. It's because you stink. I talked to a guy one day, and he was talking about that. You know, I was talking about how he was hoping to find a woman, and I'm like trying to keep my distance because he smells of B.O. And I'm thinking, you know, great help will be a little bit of deodorant. That'll make a big difference. Women aren't really sensitive to that stuff. They're more sensitive than men. And I don't even want to be near you because you smell so bad. I'm telling you, the, a woman's not going to unless she is the type two. Some women, they're not that good about the body odor stuff either. You say, you know, you shouldn't pick on people about that kind of stuff. You shouldn't. Here's a rule in our house. You don't make fun of people about things that they can't help. You know, and I'm, that might be a terrible rule. But you know what? If you stink, you can help that. All right. It's called a bath. It's called soap. And you need to understand that, you know, this isn't just you. Okay. If you're a Christian, you represent Christ in your body and I just don't think it's a good testimony to stink. And we need to think about that stuff. You know, don't come to church smelling like B.O. Oh, brother Tommy, you're against poor people coming to church. No, people always do. They act like it's poor. You know, people are stink because they're poor. No, they're poor because they stink. That's, how, that's the reality of it. And it, all it takes is a little bit of character. Well, you know, I took a bath this morning. Yeah, but you didn't clean your house. You let your animals go all over the place in the house. You don't clean up after them. And so I don't care how many baths you take, you're still going to stink. You know, it's just called having a little bit of character. And it's amazing how many people, they can't afford to feed their kids. They can't afford laundry detergent, but they can afford to have a dog pound in their house or, you know, just an animals everywhere. And you need to understand, you say, no, this is, this is picky. This is petty stuff. Bible says to glorify him in our bodies. And when you look and smell and are just all dirty, nasty, and disgusting, it shows a lack of character. And you shouldn't be that way. And, you know, it, it's, it, it's disrespectful to everybody else. Hey, Burger King, I, I, I like Burger King. But you know what? I, I was in there eating one day and this worker kept walking by and just reeked to be, oh, you know, I don't want to smell that when I'm eating. And I'm thinking, why don't they tell their workers to take a shower? Why don't they tell their workers to clean up? And they got everything all remodeled. And I was hoping they got it, you know, and this guy always smells. And I was hoping maybe they got some new workers with their, you know, knew everything else they got. And I went in there yesterday and he's still there. And I'm like, oh, great. I'm still going to have to smell this guy. I hope they've got a new deodorant policy in the place. You think, yeah, you're being a snob. No, I'm not. This stuff is easily taken care of by things that don't cost a lot of money and things that just take a little, all it takes is a little bit of character. And people who stink are not victims. Everybody else that has to smell them is the victim. And you know, I, and I'm not trying. I'm not trying to. You know, I'm not even trying to be funny. I'm serious about this. You need to take this stuff serious. It will affect you. It will affect relationships. It will affect friendships. It will affect whether or not you get a job. If you're wanting to get a job in an office somewhere and you show up for an interview smelling really bad, they're like, you know, I'm not going to want to have this guy in the office all the time. And, you know, nowadays you can get in trouble for, you know, getting on to somebody for smelling bad. And I don't believe in bullying, but you know what? I'm thankful I went to a school 
that wasn't politically correct that girls didn't get in trouble if they told the boys they stank. Because, you know, I, I went through that phase. You know, boys, they, go, they, they get to that age where, you know, before you didn't have to use deodorant that much, but then you start needing to, and they're very unaware of things and just, uh, you know, and sometimes it takes somebody making fun of them. And I got the hint and, you know, started t- paying attention to those things. But a lot of people today, you know, you're not allowed to say anything, but the thing is people are still going to think it and it, it's going to affect them. And so we need, we need to think about that stuff. We are not our own. Okay. If you're a married husbands, take a shower. You're not your own. You're dwelling with your wife. She doesn't, shouldn't have to smell you. You know, she shouldn't have to put up with your grossness. You're not your own. You have to take these things into consideration. And so, and look at, um, first Corinthians chapter seven, verse three, just in the next chapter, it says, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. And likewise, also the wife unto the husband, the wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband and likewise, also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife defraud ye not one another, except be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not. For your incontinency. Notice how it says here, even if you're wanting to do something good, like you know, fasting and praying, the Bible says that, you know, husbands and wives, you need to get permission from each other. Well, why is this? Because of the fact that you are one flesh. And, you know, there are needs that both of you have. And it's not right for just one of you to just run off and say, you know what, I need this. I'm going to do this. And not think about the other one. And husbands, you need to understand, even though you're the head of the home, that doesn't mean you just go and do whatever you feel like doing. You're supposed to take into consideration the fact that you have a wife and that what you do, it it affects her. You know, husbands, you might think, I'm the man of the house. You know what? I could live out in the wilderness. I could live off the grid. You know, I could go and I could live without electricity and running water and all those things. Okay, maybe you can, but I'll bet your wife can't. And I'll at least bet that she really doesn't want to. Yeah, well, she, I'm the head of the house. She needs to follow my lead. But you know what the Bible says? We need to give honor unto our wife as unto the weaker vessel. So maybe you can tough it out. Maybe you can handle it, but maybe she can't. And so you need to think about that and take into consideration what she needs because the two of you are one. You need to think about, fathers, before you make big decisions, if you've got children in your house, how is this going to affect my children? You can't just run off and do whatever you want because if you are married, if you are a parent, you are not your own. And if you're saved, you are not your own. You do, the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And you know what he doesn't like? He doesn't like sin. He doesn't like unholiness and you better take into consideration before you go and you watch that dirty movie, before you do that wicked thing that you've got the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. And that kind of behavior grieves him. And just like you as a husband, if you go and just do whatever you want, whatever you want, then you you need to realize that's going to affect my wife. That's going to hurt my wife. It's going to hurt my marriage. You need to understand if you just go and do whatever your flesh feels like doing, it's going to hurt your relationship with God. And you need to understand that you are not your own and your decisions that you make, they don't just affect you. They affect others and they also affect God. And we need to keep that in mind. And so, uh, you know, you need to make, you know, say, get permission. I don't need permission from my wife or anything. Just because you consult your wife about something, it doesn't mean you're not the man of the house. It doesn't mean you're not an authority. It just means you're giving her honor. You're you're recognizing the fact that what I'm going to do is going to affect you. And I want to make sure I take care of you because that is my job as a husband. And I don't want to put more on my wife than she can handle. And you can, you can treat her like Cinderella and just have her working all day and cleaning all night and, you know, doing it, but you're going to burn her out. And we live in America. She might decide I'm done with you and she might move on. And I'm not saying it's right, but you need to understand that that could happen. And you need, and it is, it's your responsibility as a husband that you're supposed to, you know, take care of her, not just be a boss and order her around. You're supposed to take care of her. 
And so you need to make sure you realize the decisions you make, they don't affect just me, they affect her too, because the two of you are one flesh, and our body is the temple of the Holy God. It says we are one spirit with Him, and therefore what we do does not affect just us, it affects Him too. What we do in our body. So these things are important. And it's okay. It's okay for you to have a will, to have desires, to have goals, but you should always make sure that's not going against God's plan for your life. Ladies, you might have something you desire to do. You know, maybe you'd really love to just go to Florida right now, you know, before it gets too cold. You just, you just love to do that. But you know what? You don't get to just go and leave, fly to Florida, not tell your husband, spend all that money. I know a lady that did that one time. Also, her husband, where's, where's my wife? Doesn't know where she's at. Turns out she's in Florida. She just she needed to get away. Well, here's the problem with that. You're married. You what you do affects him. That money you spent affected him. You need, not being with him affects him. If you really need that trip, you know you need to talk to him about it. And then husbands, if you can do something about it, you know, you know, help him out. I would prefer my wife not go to Florida without me. But, you know, I've let her go places before. I've let her go do things before. But, you know, she doesn't just run off and do whatever she wants. And I don't do that, I don't do that either. It wouldn't be right for me to do that, for my wife to wonder where I am one day. She calls me up. You know, I'm in Florida. Why? Because <laughs> I'm the head of the household, and I can do what I want to do. I, you, I'm telling you, you all know that wouldn't go well in many marriages, would it? All right, maybe unless you've got a really easygoing wife, my wife wouldn't be okay with that. She, she wouldn't. And it doesn't mean I'm not the head of the household. It's just, I'm, it's okay. And it's okay if you, you might have desires, but you got to get permission. And it's the same thing. If there might be things that we want in our life, but we've got to make sure that those are God's will. You might want to live out in the mountains in Colorado or someplace like that. But is that what God wants? You need to find out first. You need to make sure that's his will that you do that type of thing. And so it is same thing for what, you know, a wife, she can have things that she wants, but they can't overrule what the husband wants to. And sometimes there's going to come a point where there's going to be disagreements and we're like, all right, we're trying to work this out. I want this. She wants that. And then, and sometimes you have to go and pull rank. All right. That happens sometimes. And you got to say, well, you know, I am the head of the household and you have to end up doing what the husband wants in that situation. But understand that husbands, you know, before you do that, you better be taking these things into consideration because the two of you are one flesh and we need to, we need to remember the same thing with God. And if you do, if you have a desire for your life, something you want, let God know about it, pray about it, ask him about it, but never step outside of his will to get it. Never do that because you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. And I do our acknowledging of our wives' desires and needs, I believe, is one of the ways we honor them. First Peter 3, verse 5 says, For after this manner in old time, the, women, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Yeah, we like that verse. And really, this one here, this one's great. Even Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Whose daughters ye are as long as you do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Sarah called her husband Lord. All right, now we don't use that term today for authority and things like that, but that's all that is. And all what the Bible is saying there when she called him Lord, it's not saying God, it's not saying he wants all women or all wives to call their husband Lord. But what it's saying is that she under recognized him as her authority. The holy women did that. They recognized that their husband was the authority. And boy, we love that. We like to pound our chest and you know, talk about that whenever there's a disagreement. But verse 7 says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So you do. You need to give her that honor. And sometimes you might say, you know what? I want to do this. I want to go on a two-week-long hunting trip. I want to spend all our savings on that trip. That's what I want to do, but it's going to add a burden to my wife. If I'm gone for two weeks, if I spend all our savings, 
I probably should talk to her about this. You know what? That's just, that's just giving honor unto the wife who's in the weaker vessel. And I don't mind being broke. I can just trust the Lord and have faith. Well, she might not be able to. So, you know, just, you know, you need to dwell with them according to knowledge. Think about how this is going to affect them. It's amazing how many husbands, they do really stupid things that gets their wives really mad at them. And then they're like, I don't know why she's mad. And I'm, I'm thinking, I could have told you that was going to make her mad. I could have told you that was going to create problems. You know, have you not got to know this person that you've been living with all these years? Dwell with them according to knowledge and give honor unto them as unto the weaker vessel. You know, well, we'll spend all our money. We might lose our house. That's okay. I could live in a tent. But your wife probably can't live in a tent. So think about those things. Take that into consideration. And so that's the husband and wife thing. But we need to take the same thing when it comes to us and God. Well, I can, I can handle the rock music. I could handle the dirty movies. But you know what? The Holy Spirit of God doesn't want to deal with those things. He doesn't want to be grieved by those things. The Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. He's stuck with you. And he's not, he doesn't have an opportunity to leave, okay? Once again, we live in America. We've messed everything up. And that used to be the mentality. You know, the husbands and wives, they're stuck with each other. And so, you know, you take those things into consideration. Now people can just leave for whatever they want. But you know what? When it comes to our relationship with God, we're stuck with him and he's stuck with us. And so understand that if you do, if you go grieving the Holy Spirit, it's going to cause problems. And, it's going to, and you're not going to be happy. Just like if you don't take into consideration the husband and wife, you're going to have problems in your marriage. And so understand that it's, it is, it's important that we are careful with that. So that remember that you are not your own. Remember that your body has a purpose. Okay? It's God's temple. What know ye not that your body is the temple of God? And jump back to verse 9. Let's look back at verse 9 again. This, this passage right here often confuses people. And a lot of false doctrine can be taught if you uh, don't interpret the scripture correctly. But look what it says. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, people will get confused with this passage, basically, and they'll teach, if you do any of those things, you're not going to heaven. You're not really saved. Because, you know, fornicators, you know, drunkards, you know, all, it's naming off all these terrible sins. They are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And so then the question comes up, somebody gets saved, and then maybe they do one of these sins. So does that mean that they weren't saved? Because if you fornicate, what does that make you? It makes you a fornicator. If you steal, what does that make you? It makes you a thief. But the Bible says they're not going into the kingdom of God. So, all right, I've done those things for... So that means I need to go get saved again so that will all get washed away. And then I am not those things anymore. But then what if I do it again later? Then are I not one of those things? And so you'll have people to say, you know, saved people can't do those things. It's not possible for a saved person to do that. But I think most of us would agree that saved people sometimes do some of these things. So what's it saying? Because it says such were some of you. Okay. Now let me ask you. Why are we, the Bible says the unrighteous aren't going to inherit the kingdom of God. Why are we righteous today? Is it because of our works or because of our faith? The Bible says it's because of our faith. It's not because of our works. So why are we right? Are we righteous today because we quit doing all those things? Or is it because of our faith? It's because of our faith, isn't it? So understand that even though, yes, you and I are sinners and we've committed some of these things, you know, such were some of you, we are not those things because Christ's blood cleansed us from those things. We are not those things, not because we've never done those things, not because we will never do those things again, but because the blood of Christ cleansed us from all sin. So since Christ has cleansed us from all sins, what he's saying there is don't do those things. Those people, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. You've been washed. You've been cleansed. 
You were some of those things, but you're not anymore because you've been washed. So you know what he's saying? He's saying, don't do that because your body is the temple of God. Don't do that. Right there showing that it is possible for us to do those things, but we shouldn't do those things. Don't do that. God cleansed you from those things. He washed you. He purified you. He sanctified you. He did all those things. And for you to go and to commit these sins when you've got Christ in you, do you understand that you are grieving the Holy Spirit of God? It was just affecting you before. When you were in fornication before, it just affected you. It hurt you. But now it's not just you. It's hurting the Holy Spirit too. And you are not your own. And so when God tells us, don't do those things, it's because, you know, this isn't just affecting you anymore. And we are not, I, it's, I'm, I'm not a thief today, not because I've never stole, or I'm not a fornicator, not because I've never fornicated. I am not righteous today because I've never committed any unrighteousness. I am righteous today, and I am none of those things today because of my faith, because I've been cleansed from my sins. And so that's what that's teaching right there. So that verse doesn't mean everyone who does those things isn't saved. But because God has washed us, God's washed us, and so we should not do those things. We should never do those things. God wants us, he doesn't want us to just not do the bad things, but we've also, we're also supposed to do the Lord's work. Okay? We've, we have a purpose, and it's not just to not do stuff. If your purpose in life is just to not do certain things, eventually you're going to do those things. You've got to find something else to do. And we ought to be doing the Lord's work. We ought to be doing what he's commanded us to do. We ought to be going to church. We ought to be winning souls. We ought to be reading our Bibles. We ought to be praying. We ought to be doing all the things that he commanded us to do. Well, and you know what? And I'm going to talk about, the, I'll talk about this briefly. I don't want to, I hope I don't, I probably made you all mad just with the smelling stuff. All right. You know, but um, I think we ought to try to keep ourselves healthy. This isn't just our body. You know how many people I've heard say, you know, I, I've got to get myself in shape. I've got to be healthy because I want to be there for my family. And you know what? That's a good motivation because you understand that your family loves you and they care about you. So you shouldn't be drinking yourself to death. You shouldn't be smoking yourself into, you know, lung cancer, you know, and you shouldn't be eating yourself into a heart attack. Okay. And I am not the model of what you should eat and drink and all those things. I, I'm, I'm struggling with my soda addiction, things like that. I'm not claiming perfection up here in this area. And, but we need to take these things into consideration. I have a family that depends on me. You know, I have, I, I have a wife and kids that I am providing for. And so I shouldn't be doing reckless things. Okay? I probably, it probably wouldn't be wise for me to just go and start a hobby of, you know, uh, stunt man stuff or, you know, some of these crazy things they do on motorcycles and stuff like that. I've got a lot of people depending on me. I remember the first time I ever went skiing. I actually did pretty good for my first time skiing. I, st- I was, my first day out there, I was going down the intermediate hills. Now, I wasn't succeeding. I was taking some nasty falls. I mean, I beat the snot out of myself. I mean, I took some nasty falls, but you know what? I was young. We had actually just got married. My wife was pregnant with Tommy. And, you know, I still was at that young, kind of crazy, reckless stage. And I never went skiing again until about five or six years later, maybe even a little longer. And I was terrible at it. And you know why? It was because I, my survival instinct was like, in big time. I now had a few kids and I had to be able to work and be able to take care of my family. I'm like, I can't afford to get hurt. I can't afford to break my leg skiing. Okay. Skiing's fun, but I'm not accomplishing any good by skiing, am I? And so I was really, really, really careful. And as a result of that, you know, with skiing, you know, you can't be too careful. Otherwise, you know, and you know what? It took me about three years before I ever went down an intermediate hill again. And it was pretty unsuccessful, and I didn't try it again after that. But, I mean, you know, it is. Young people, they don't have that survival instinct. But later, you kind of do because you're thinking, I've got people depending on me. And so you ought to consider that before you start shooting yourself up with drugs. You better think about the fact, I'm young now, it's just me. But do do you want to get married one of these days? Do you want to have a family? Do you want to accomplish something? You better not go frying your brain. 
because then you're not going to be able to get a good job. You're not going to be able to take good care of your family. You're not going to be able to do the things. You know, I, I, I might want to be a preacher one of these days. Well, you know what? You need to have a brain. Hey, I wish I was a lot smarter than I am. I wish I think better than I did. But you know what? I've got the hand I was dealt. All right? I'm not a genius or anything like that. I don't have the great talents. But you know one thing I've never done? I've never done anything reckless to handicap myself like take drugs. You know, and I struggle enough you know, keeping my thoughts straight. I don't need to add alcohol into the factor and making it even more difficult and you know, with how much I struggle with soda, why would I ever mess with nicotine and alcohol and all those other things? I would lose for sure. I know I would lose. And so I do, I need to keep myself healthy because of that. I've got people counting on me that are depending on me and I need to be able to do the things that I want to do. And if I'm sick all the time, I'm missing church all the time, time because I'm sick and I can't do I'm supposed to do it. You know, it's one thing. Sometimes people get things that they can't help. We, there's a lot of crazy sicknesses in this world that you can come down with and it's not your fault. There's a lot of diseases out there. But you know what? Some things we know where they come from. And if I go on a steady diet of McDonald's, I'm going to have some health problems later. And I'm not going to be able to do the things that God wants me to do because I didn't take care of myself. So we ought to keep yourselves healthy. You might have to do some exercise. You might need to go on a walk. You might need to run. You might need to do some of those things. It will help you live longer so you can do more for Christ. And so you know, we don't need to be constantly indulging ourselves. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 21. I hate to go to the Old Testament on you and show you anything uh, in there that might be unpleasant or not what we want to hear. But listen, we live in a spoiled rotten society that just can't get enough of things you know we live in the same society where we got to have 500 channels in our cable package you know that's got to have you know 15 zillion different choices of food from mcdonald's that's got you know the same place that has buffets you know because there's nothing on a menu in a regular restaurant that's going to satisfy us you know we do we just we, we just can't get enough of anything and in Deuteronomy 21, verse 18, and I want to, this verse constantly gets thrown in my face about stuff, and people do not understand what this passage is saying, but I need to clear this up. Deuteronomy 21, 18, if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out to the elders of the city and unto the gates of this, his place. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shall ye put evil away from among you. And all Israel shall hear and fear. Okay, now that's pretty harsh, isn't it? Now this verse constantly gets thrown at us who are still for the, you know, we teach that the death penalty for certain things that the Bible taught was appropriate for is still appropriate and they'll say well then you should you know you think that people ought to stone their disobedient children implying that you know little junior who's five years old who won't pick up his toys that we ought to take him out and stone him but these people that say this it's like they're being ignorant on purpose when you read this passage if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son does it say anything about him being a little kid okay and when you've chastened him does it mean you spanked them one time and it didn't get the message across? No, you went through the whole chastening process, but now he, he's grown up. How many drunkards have you known at 10 years old and 11 years old and 12 years old? This is that basement dwelling millennial that we have today that won't leave his mom and dad's basement. Mom's got to bring him his TV dinners downstairs all the time while he stuffs his face. He won't go out and get a job. He's a drunkard and a glutton. He's a lazy good for nothing. And we've beat him and he will not go and do anything. And the Bible says, then you take him to the elders of the city and you stone him and put away evil. Because you know what? It's evil to be a lazy, glutton, good for nothing, leech on society. And today we don't stone those people. We enable those people. And we have them all over. And the Bible says you know, that that will put away evil from among you. Are you saying we need to go stoning all these people like that? Obviously, 
that's not going to happen. But will we at least admit that because we don't do this, that evil is running amok in our country? That e- I mean, these are these people, these are the people that are on the internet doing the abominable. These are the perverts, the things that I don't even want to mention and describe. I've met some of these people. I saw one yesterday. This guy, he was in his 40s, and he was the perfect picture of a lazy, good-for-nothing glutton. And he is there, and he is on his, he's on his phone. I, I'm not lying to you, folks. I would not get up here in the pulpit and lie to you. He's on his phone doing one of these video chat things. I'm sitting in my truck, and I can hear everything he's saying. And he's talking to this woman that he met online. And this is the first time they've seen what each other look like. And all he can talk about, you know, is how undisappointed she is, or he is. And I'm thinking, man, I hope she's disappointed. Because if not, you know, what does she look like? But, you know, he was, kept talking about how good she looked and how he was pleasantly surprised at how she looks. And I'm like, when you are in your 40s and you're in that type of relationship, I, I, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, mama's boy loser. And so he finishes his conversation. He goes in the restaurant, and a little bit later, he comes out, and guess who he's with? He's with his mom, and he's telling about the girl that he just talked to. And I'm just like, you know, what a miserable existence. You know, and this guy, too, it was funny. You know, he said something about, and this guy's like pale white. I don't think this guy's ever been in sunlight. And I'm thinking, I, I, was like, I guarantee you he lives in his mom's basement. And it, it just a nasty, pervy-looking guy. And I'm, that's who this is talking about in Deuteronomy. It's not talking about Junior that you spanked one time and he didn't listen to you, saying you need to go out and stone him. And these people that say that, they're being stupid on purpose just because they don't like what the Bible says. But understand that we do. We have millions of people in this country that they don't work, they don't do anything, they're lazy, and they just indulge themselves with hours and hours of television, with just food, I mean just tons and tons of food, and they just eat, and they do nothing, and they contribute nothing to society, and they just leech off of everybody, and I'm telling you right now, that is evil, and we should not be like that, we ought to have some self-control, we ought to be able to you know, do some work, And to accomplish some things in our life and not just be indulging ourselves and just living on just, you know, junk and luxuries and things that we don't, we don't even need. But that is the attitude today. I shouldn't have to drink water. You know, I'm thirsty. Well, go get a drink of water. No, I'm going to Starbucks. I'm going to spend $7 for a drink. Drink some water. All right. You don't need to be indulging yourself. If you want to treat yourself and go get a Starbucks every once in a while, go right ahead. There's nothing wrong with that. But that doesn't need to be a regular in your diet. But that's our mentality today. I, I, I know people, they go to Starbucks every day. Sometimes more than once a day. And... Even if you can't afford that, I don't think that I don't think that's right. That's a lot of junk that you're putting through yourself that you, you just you don't really need. Go get a bottle of water. You know, go get a fancy one, you know. This Dasani or something. That sounds fancy, you know. And it's still a whole lot cheaper, you know. Avion and all that. You know, they all they make it sound so good, don't it? But you know what? It's just water. <laughs> that's all it is. But I, I I need to go through the rest of these quick, but you know, keep it healthy. Um, Proverbs twenty three nineteen says, "Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh, for the drunkard and the glutton." Okay, that person that's just constantly indulging themselves, that just spoils themselves rotten, shall they will come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. You know what the problem with these people that are out there that just are gluttons and drunkards and good for nothings that can't go out and can't get a job and can't accomplish anything. You know, their, their problem is not that the government's not giving them enough money. The problem is the government's giving them too much money and it has enabled them to be worthless and it will continue to live a horrible, impoverished life until they go and they start doing something. And it's amazing how many parents will help their kids into patheticness 
by just giving them money, bailing them out of every situation, not making them work for anything. Well, I don't have any work for them to do. Then make them run five miles before you give them any money. Make them do something. Make them go dig a ditch and then fill it back in. People need to work. Do not let people get away with getting something for nothing. You will destroy them. Just like parents destroy their children when they will not chasten them. The Bible says that he that spareth his rod, the rod hateth his son. I don't hate him. I love him. No, you hate him because you have ruined him. You have destroyed him by, by not disciplining him. And so our body, it has a purpose. It's God's temple and we need to take care of it. And we need to be an example in what we do in our body. And then just real quickly, we need to understand too that the Bible says, you know, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. When you're yoked up with something, okay, you're kind of connected to each other. And if we get ourselves too connected with the lost, it's going to end up pulling us down. And, you know, Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, and this is about, this is specifically about uh, salvation here. But we need to submit our body to him. That's the key to happiness, submitting to what he wants. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Salvation is easy. The people he Jesus was talking to, they made salvation hard. But he said, you know what? Come unto me. My yoke is easy. The only way we can get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And you know what? He does all the work. We don't have to do any work. But you know what? We are, so we are with Christ today. We are one with him. We are yoked up with him. And being yoked with Christ is only difficult when we try to do our own will. That's what makes your life difficult. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 15, you know, that the way of the transgressors is hard. And our flesh, it lies about what will bring us happiness. It lies to us. And we keep falling for it. But Psalms 37, 4, I I want these things. I got to have these things. I understand I'm a Christian, but no, I just, I really want to do this. I really want to accomplish this. But I believe if you will, if you will recognize the fact that you are not your own, if you will recognize that Jesus Christ is the authority in our life and you will just submit to his will and you will say, you know, I know I want this, but he's the authority. I'm going to do what he wants. Proverbs 37, 4 says, delight thyself also in the Lord. And he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. If you will put his will in priority over your will, the Bible says he'll give you the desires of your heart. That's what he promised. I was like, I would have more pleasure doing my own thing. Well, you know what? You need to change that. Say, you know what? I'm going to have, I'm going to get my pleasure from doing his thing. I'm going to get my pleasure from doing what he wants me to do. And if you will do that, if you will say, you know what? Okay, I do. This is what I want for my life. I want to, you know, I want to live up in the mountains of Colorado away from everybody. So I have to put up with people, you know, and I want to have a lot of money and I want to, you know, be able to hunt whenever I want or whatever, you know, whatever it is, you know, if you'll say, but you know what? I would rather please God. Bible says he'll give you the desires of your heart. So I'm going to get the house in Colorado. I'm going to get all the money, blah, 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 blah. Well, here's the thing. Remember your heart lies about what you want. But God knows what you really want. God knows those desires you have. The reason you desire for all the money is you think this will make me happy. This will give me peace. This will give me security. That's why you desire those things. But you know what? If you'll delight yourself in the Lord, God will give you all those things that you want. And he might do it with the money. He might do it without the money. It's, you know, we don't know. The thing is, we have to trust him. And when we do... We will be happy. And so we all, we do, we all love the verse where Jesus says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. We all love the verses about eternal security, but I'm afraid that sometimes our security in Christ, it causes us to take him for granted and we forget he's there with us and we can't just do our own thing. We need to submit to his will. Why? Because we are not our own. We've been bought with a price. And so, you know what? We need to recognize it every day that Christ is with me. He is with me and I'm going to submit to his will. I'm going to do what he wants and I'm going to glorify him in my life. And if you will do that, if you will go against the will of the flesh and you will follow the spirit, you'll be happier than you've ever been.
He will bring you that peace and joy. And so that's how we glorify God in our bodies. And so with that, let's.